day, First Presbyterian Church. We're here to worship our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. We're glad to have everybody here with us today. We're, we're thankful to have you uh, with us uh, visiting, uh, if you're here visiting with us today, and glad to have everybody online as well. I'd like to let you know a few things going on in the life of our church. We have, um, first of all, something that happened this past weekend. We had our family ministries bonfire at the Napiers, and um, wonderful time. It was uh, a great bonfire, and everybody had a wonderful time. And we've also got another family ministries fellowship time, dinner and fellowship at the park for children, youth, and young families. Oakland Terrace Park, that'll be Wednesday, February 24th. You can see more information about that in the bulletin. Put that on your calendar. Um, we did have our Sunday school kickoff today for children and youth immediately following the early uh, service, and uh, that will continue. Uh, there's a deacons meeting tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Take note of that. And the session meeting, which would have normally met on uh, Sunday, February 14th is not going to meet on February 14th. It's going to meet on the 21st. So take note of that session members. And then if you are watching us online, uh, you can watch us either via Facebook Live and we've also got our church YouTube site and you can access that by logging uh, into the church website, going to the church website and clicking on the media tab. In terms of rebuild information, uh, we have some FEMA progress, and FEMA has returned a cost estimate to one small section, that is the contents of our social hall, our chapel, and our preschool area. And they have, uh, as they say, costed it uh, at 107000 and FEMA pays 75%, and so that would um, give us 80,000, approximately $80,000, and uh, for, by FEMA standards, this is a very small portion, and this particular portion must go to uh, like, um, like purchases. Uh, so it is, it's the beginning, and it's good news that uh, things are moving through the process. Uh, continue to pray for um, the church sanctuary, Sunday school wing, and the education building that those would be deemed eligible and that they would, um, that God would move in hearts, move in the hearts of the kings or the king's people uh, for that to happen. In addition, I signed the damages uh, as the uh, representative of the church for the sanctuary building and contents. Um, this is the third time I've signed that. And so I'm not sure, I want to be careful in making too big a deal of it, um, but I do think, again, that's a sign of progress. And so um, let's give thanks to the Lord for that and keep praying that he'll provide uh, for our rebuild in his lavish grace. And with that, uh, let's worship the Lord. Our call to worship today comes from Revelation 4. This is going to be verses 6. Through eight. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the seven living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Well, let's stand and join with heaven as we sing as well, Holy, holy, holy.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, we have come together as your children to worship you in power, to worship you in your purity, to worship you in spirit and truth. And so we ask in the name of Christ that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we might worship you rightly, that we might see the face of Jesus, and that we might leave this place in awe of him. We pray all this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Our confession of faith today is the Apostles' Creed. It's going to be up on the screen. It's going to be in your bulletin. We're going to recite it together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave. He is the great giver. He is our Father who gives us all good things. And now we come to a chance where we can give back joyfully of the good things he's given us. We're not passing the plate during this time of tithes and offerings, but we do have a plate out in the foyer. And if you're watching online, there's multiple ways. You can text to give. You can uh, mail a check. Whatever is easiest for you. Let me pray and bless the offering. Jesus, we thank you that you did come to die for our sins. We thank you that you give us all good things, that we live and move and have our being in you. And so now as we come to a time of worship here, we want to give back joyfully of the good things you've given to us. So let us be cheerful givers and bless these tithes and these offerings, Lord. Bless the ministry of our church, we pray in in your name. Amen. From the depths of woe I raise to thee the voice of lamentation. Lord, turn a gracious ear to me and hear my supplication. If thou iniquities dost mark our secret sins and misdeeds dark, oh, who shall stand before thee oh who shall stand before thee to wash away the crimson stain grace grace alone availeth our works alas are Watch the best life faileth. No man can glory in thy sight. All must alike confess thy might and live alone by mercy. Therefore my trust is in the Lord and not in mine own merit. On him my soul shall rest, his word upholds my fainting spirit. His pr- 
promised mercy is my fort, my comfort and my sweet support. I wait for it with patience. I wait for it with patience. What the still trusteth in his might it doubteth not nor feareth do thus so ye of israel's seed ye of the spirit born indeed and wait till god appeareth and wait shepherd good and true is he who will at last his Israel free from all their sin and sorrow from all their sin and sorrow from Go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we cry out from the depths of our woe, from our miserable states of sin. Our sins, they are many, but praise God that your mercy is more. And so we move from breath to breath, from day to day, solely by grace alone, through Jesus Christ alone who is our Savior, who is our King. We love him, and we thank you for sending him to die for us on the cross. And so now it is in his name that we come to you as your people, as your children. We come to you with uh, names of your beloved children, names of people we have been praying for, for uh, some for quite a while, others we've taken off, and we thank you for that, Lord. We pray for Cassie Carter, Who's, uh, we pray for Kenneth Cole, for Bruce Cutright, for Edgar Daffin, Lord, who was uh, recently just had COVID, and now he's over that, and we praise you for that, Lord. We thank you so much that he's uh, gotten through that, and so now he's uh, back in town re- at a re- rehab facility, Lord. We ask that you just be with him, be with Joe and Jeannie Faulkner, be with Sue Harrell, be with Betsy Hayes, Glenn Hayes, Russell Jinks, Truett Lucas, Lord, be with Angeline Manning, Bill Marar, Victoria Musgrave. Linda Rice, Bob Shaw, Jeb Stewart, and we uh, pray for Beverly Webb for uh, wisdom for her treatment of heart concerns, Lord. We pray for those on our honor roll as well, those who cannot be with us for one reason or another. We are just so thankful, again, that you have taken names off this list. We're thankful that these names of our brothers and sisters, that you uh, know every single hair on their head, that you know their innermost thoughts and their desires and their needs and their wants. And Lord, not one tear has been shed from any of the saints that you did not account for. And so we are just so thankful that you are a loving Father that watches over us, that gives us what we need, that corrects us. Thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And so now we ask for ourselves here, for our church, Lord. As Ron mentioned, we are so thankful that FEMA is moving forward, that there's progress there. We ask for a continued progress on the sale of our building, on the, on the rebuild process, Lord. We ask that that would just continue to go. We ask for an end to COVID, uh, the exhaustion of this. I'm sure everyone is feeling it by now, Lord, and so we just need it to end. We'd ask that the vaccine would roll out and that um, there'd just be an end to it, that it would be done. 
Father, be with Ron today as he brings your word. Uh, I ask that it would bless us, that we would see Jesus clearly, that we would leave this place in awe of his amazing grace for us, and that you would just uh, empower us to go forward this week uh, in your spirit, Lord, to love others and to love you as we should, Lord. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand together again as we sing our next hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour. Please be seated. We return to our study on the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2, verses 3 through 8 is what we will be looking at today, and it's a rather lengthy section, so read along with your Bibles or on the screen behind me. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their consciences also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know His will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. 
His praise is not from man, but from God. Then what advantage has the Jew, or in what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means let God be true, though everyone were a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying? Their condemnation is just. Father, we do come to you this morning and we pray that you would open our our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the truth and that you may transform us through your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What we find in our text today is that privilege does not protect you from perdition, to use the old term, perdition or hell, the day of judgment. We've been learning as we've been reading and and studying in Romans that there is a day of judgment. We see that here in the text today, a day when Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, will judge. And let me ask you the question... Are you going to be judged on that day uh, by aristocracy or meritocracy? Which is it going to be? Aristocracy, you know, that's basically you're born into aristocracy. You're born with the silver spoon. And, um, you know, you can't really raise or lower your standing. Uh, You're either born with that status or not. I was saw a recent ep- episode of The Crown. Perhaps some of you have seen it, and I don't know if this actually is truth or fiction, but in it, uh, Prince Andrew was getting married. It was his wedding day, and he was there with Prince Charles, and Prince Andrew was sort of bemoaning the fact that he really didn't feel like that the press was giving enough coverage to his wedding, and Pr- Prince Charles said something to the effect of, you're fourth in line to The Crown, and your fringe royalty. Uh, it's certainly, in your, your press coverage is in keeping with the level of status that you have by virtue of your birth, right? So you can't, you can't su- supersede it, you can't go above it, you can't go below it. Is, is that the, by virtue of our aristocracy we're going to be judged, or is it by virtue of meritocracy? What's meritocracy? It's just the opposite, that you can change your status, you can change your social status, your financial status by working, by earning it. It can change in a society that is a meritocracy society. Well, what we learn in our text today that it is a matter of meritocracy, that judgment is meritocracy, not a matter of privilege. And so for you note takers, uh, what we have coming here today is there will be a judgment day and we're going to be based, judged on the basis of the law, not privilege, okay? And we'll find that part of the way that the Jews were privileged was they in fact did receive the word of God and they also received the sign of privilege of circumcision. And then finally, we'll look at the fact that there's no escaping judgment. Judgment is by Jesus Christ. We learn that um, and on the basis of merit in verses 12 through 16. Let's do a little uh, review, and we'll see some of that's already been stated by the Apostle Paul, Romans 2, 1. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Romans 2, 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. 
Judgment is on the basis of merit. When I think of merit, the um, concept in my mind goes immediately to the Boy Scouts, merit badges. Uh, you earn a merit badge. It's a site online that uh, was, is hosted by a, an Eagle Scout, and he talks about which merit badges are uh, particularly difficult to earn. He says, snow sports is difficult if you're a scout living in Hawaii. Gardening is difficult if you don't have access to a garden. Aviation is difficult if you don't have access to a flight simulator. Horsemanship is difficult if you don't have a horse. Bugling is pretty tricky for people that can't play brass instruments. And super difficult is the nuclear energy badge. I would think so. Keeping God's law is how you merit a judgment of righteous on Judgment Day. How do you receive the merit badge of righteousness? You earn it by keeping the law. You merit it. Romans 2.13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Jesus Christ will be the judge that determines whether you are guilty or not guilty. Verse 16, God judges by Christ Jesus. There's going to be no wiggle room. There won't be any fudge factor. You can't lie your way out and pretend that you were better than you were because in verse 16 we, we read that the secrets of men are judged. Everything will be laid bare. And those who are judged to be guilty of violating God's law will receive the penalty. It's alluded to in verse 12, for all who sinned apart from the law will perish apart from the law, and all those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. They will face perdition, to use the old term, and some of our English translations still call Judas the son of perdition, the son of destruction, or uh, perdition, another term for hell. And we have uh, references to that, to judgment. Jesus Christ in a parable in Luke chapter 13 is referring to himself when he says, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves will be cast out. And so we learn here from this point forward in the text is that our privileged status will not get us into God's kingdom, nor will it keep us out of perdition, because the law will be used as God's standard of judgment. Romans 2.17, but if you call yourself a Jew, that's where he begins to talk about the privilege. That's your self-identity. And I'm reminded of the, uh, the musical, the opera, by Gilbert and Sullivan, HMS Pinafore. Some of you know that. I'm not, I'm not going to sing it. Uh, I'm not a, a thespian, nor am I um, an opera singer. But uh, most of you know it. He is an Englishman, right? He has the status of being an Englishman. For he himself has said it, and it's greatly to his credit that he is an Englishman. For he might have been a Russian, a French, or Turk, or Prussian, or perhaps an Italian. But in spite of all temptations to belong to other nations, he remains an Englishman. Right? He had that status. If you call yourself a Jew, ah, I'm not a Gentile, I'm a Jew. They indeed had status and privilege. Deuteronomy 14.2 says this, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples of the earth who are on the face of the earth. There are two ways in which we find in the text that the Jews were privileged. And the first is that they were given the law. They were given the law at Mount Sinai. And they were given, as it says in our text today, the very oracles of God. And, we, and he goes through several of the, the benefits of that. Verse 17, you've been given God's law. You rely on God's law. You boast in God. 
You know his will through it. Verse 18, you know what is good and affirm it, not like those immortal, immoral brutes uh, that don't. Verse 18, you know his will and approve what is excellent because you're instructed from the law. Verses 19 and 20, therefore you're able to help others know God's law, know right and wrong. If you're sure that you if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness. And we, as this church here today, have similar um, uh, benefit and status and privilege. We have a, a level of biblical literacy. Uh, most of you know much about the Bible. You know much about what God says about right and wrong in Scripture. You're able to tell people. What is right and wrong, you may be instructing them face-to-face, you may be instructing them over the phone, you may be instructing them on social media, uh, because you have the benefit of knowing what is right and wrong. You've been given God's Word. It's a, it's a privilege to have the Word of God uh, delivered to us. I have here in my hand, uh, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I have read it, and it's falling apart, and... Um, so I've ordered a new one, and it's taken me two weeks to find one. Why? Because there are so many choices. We have so many choices. We have God's Word given to us. We're privileged with God's Word. And you have a privilege in receiving God's Word. But guess what? That's not going to save you from perdition. It's not going to save you from judgment just because you have God's Word. Verses 21 through 24, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing? Do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking it. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. It's not about being set apart as recipients of God's Word. Judgment is going to be on the basis of keeping God's law. You teach others? Fine. Do you teach yourself? You preach against stealing? Fine. Do you steal? You affirm out loud, adultery is wrong. But do you commit adultery? You know, I knew somebody in Orlando who talked about Um, buying used cars. You know, the text that we've uh, read today says that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles on account of you, uh, you who've received the privilege of receiving God's Word. I I talked to this man, he said, uh, I've learned I'm uh, going to buy a used car from a particular cult. I found people in this particular cult uh, tell the truth. And uh, particularly when people say they're Christians and sell used cars, I've found that they're very willing to sell me, knowingly sell me a lemon, right? Name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. So don't kid yourself, church. Judgment Day is not about the fact that you grew up hearing the Bible, that mom and dad told you it, that you learned right and wrong from the preacher and from your Sunday school teacher. I grew up in the Bible Belt, the Belt of Privilege. No, it's about, it's about whether or not you obey what you heard. And secondly, there is a sign of privilege that the Jews received, sometimes called the sign of the covenant of circumcision, and that does not protect you from perdition as well. Verse 25, for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. We have signs in our culture, uh, many, many signs that, uh, that signify who we are. If you are a student and you're in some municipalities in our country, you have to be very careful about what you wear to school when you go to school because you could be wearing a particular color associated with a particular gang and you could be wearing a gang sign. It's not a good thing. Uh, but there are other good signs in our culture. Uh, You might be a member of a particular neighborhood, and you might have a little sticker on your car that designates that you're part of that particular neighborhood. Um, 
I've learned since moving here in a military area that the that you're part of the Air Force, uh, you have a call sign. Uh, now you each have your own call sign, right? It's not just one sign for the for the military for the Air Force, but you have your distinct call signs. Hey, if you're outside of the Air Force, you don't have a call sign, right? It's it's those that are part of that privileged group. And Abraham and his children received a sign in Genesis 17, a sign of a privileged relationship, and that was circumcision. And by the way, that privileged sign covered men and women. Women were covered under the sign by virtue of their relationship, either with their father or their husband. There was a connectional, family connection related to the sign uh, in the Old Testament. And we read in our text today that the Jews were not only to have an outward sign, but they were to have an inward reality, the reality uh, that the sign signified. The sign signified a soft, responsive heart, not a rebellious heart. And it's not only the Apostle Paul that stated this, it goes back to the law itself, Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. And Deuteronomy 36, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And Paul says here that an uncircumcised Gentile could have the inward reality and the Jew with the sign of privilege might not have that inward reality. Romans 2, 26 and 27, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? But he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written, have the written code in circumcision, but break the law. We'll find out in future weeks how it is that you can be a Gentile and have circumcision of the heart. Now, this was radical. This was a radical statement that the Apostle Paul was making to, to many in his day. Uh, there were rabbis that taught, pretty much, if you're circumcised, you didn't have to worry about judgment. For instance, one rabbi said this, in the hereafter, Abraham will sit at the entrance of Gehenna, of hell, and permit no circumcised Israelite to descend therein. He's going to guard and make sure you're covered. But no, the sign of privilege will not save you on Judgment Day because you're not going to be judged on the basis of the privileged sign, but on the basis of the law. Romans 2, 28 and 29, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. And here in verse 29 is a mention of the Spirit that reminds us of the sign that we have as His church, a sign of privilege, and that sign is baptism. The sign of baptism symbolizes certain things, and among the things that it symbolizes is it symbolizes the work of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit. So you might say, well, I was baptized as a child, or I was baptized as an adult. But let me tell you, Abraham nor Jesus is going to set, is going to sit uh, by hell and say, ah, I see you've been baptized, you're not coming into here, because judgment is not on the basis of the sign of privilege. It is a sign of privilege. It is something that is wonderful, but is not something that is going to, um, is not something that is the basis of judgment. God's judgment is going to be based on merit, and there's no excuse that will get us out of it. That's where in chapter 3 we begin to see Paul make that argument. First, he talks about the advantage. He says, what then, what, then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. 
And so then in verse 5, he begins to talk about excuses, hypothetical excuses that people can make. They'd say, hey, okay, Paul, you've convinced me. Yes, we are people of privilege. It's on the basis of what we do. But what about this? I mean, you know, okay, so I'm unrighteous, but my unrighteousness is going to be, is going to highlight God's righteousness. And so why would God condemn me if I'm, my life by my unrighteousness is giving Him glory, right? That's sort of the logic here. And really the, the reality is that, that we can concoct probably an infinite number of ways of trying to wiggle out judgment on the basis of keeping God's law. Last week, Heath was preaching and he gave the example of Stephen Fry, an atheist, and uh, who was asked, you know, essentially what he would say if he stood before God at judgment, and essentially his response was, I will accuse God of being evil. Um, I don't recommend that as a, uh, as a method of trying to get out of judgment on the day of judgment. Many excuses. Uh, there are many ways, and it shows that people, why, it, why is it that there are many excuses? Because people understand that they are to merit, that they have to merit eternal life. They want some way out of the reality that judgment is on the basis of merit. But Bob Dylan has said it well, a slow train is coming around the bend. It is coming, and there's nothing stopping it, and there's no way to wiggle out of it. And so let me ask you this. The Bible says that God's standard is righteousness. So are you going to merit entrance into heaven? Are you going to merit uh, on judgment day Jesus Christ declaring that you are righteous in his sight on the basis of your righteousness? Are you personally righteous? Have you merited it? Well, let's go to the mic drop, chapter 3, following this. We'll learn more about this next week. No one is righteous, no, not one, the Apostle Paul says. No one. So I got a problem, and you have a problem. Judgment is on the basis of merit. I have not merited uh, escape from judgment. So is it hopeless for me? Is it hopeless for you? And the good news is it's not hopeless because it's on the basis of law-keeping. But somebody else has kept the law perfectly, Jesus Christ. Christ died for sins, the righteous, for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Jesus Christ did what you could not do. He merited a judgment of righteousness. Jesus Christ on the cross took the wrath that he did not deserve, the judgment that he did not deserve, And why did he do that? Why did God send Jesus to do that for you? Because he loved you. Because he loved you and he knew of your need that on judgment day you would be declared guilty. And so he sent Jesus to do what you could not do and what I could not do. And so how is it that Jesus' righteous record that he has merited is now credited to us? It says this in Romans 3, 21 through 24. I could have just ended with the passage today. Law-keeping is the standard. You merit it. That's judgment. See you next week for the solution to the problem. But we'll read ahead a little bit here. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, for the righteousness of God through faith in in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Do you understand what he's saying? If you transfer your trust from your own supposed righteousness and you trust in the righteousness that Jesus Christ has merited, then you will receive the declaration of righteousness in God's sight. That's the good news. That's the wonderful news. And the Bible's point is that you're not good, and you're not going to earn a judgment of not guilty. You're not going to earn a judgment of righteous 
on righteous day on the count of your record. But Jesus has merited it for you if you believe. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all the righteous, for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the wonderful good news. So on Judgment Day, you stand before Jesus Christ. He would say something like, I know this one. I lived my life for him. I lived my life for her. I died on the cross for him. I died on the cross for her. They've placed their faith in me and what I've merited and what I've done. I will not declare them guilty. That would be unjust because my justice has already been satisfied in the cross. I received the wrath that they deserve. We receive the merit, the record of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we are people of hope. We are people of joy because we receive the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so let's sing of that now. Let's sing of this living hope that we have, uh, the great hope that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing together. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope Christ, my living hope. Please be seated. This time we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you've not already received a, a, a communion cup and you'd like to uh, participate, you'll find them in the narthex in the, um, in the foyer. Um, this sacrament that we're taking today is a privilege. It's something that God has given to you and God has given to me um, to, to bless us as a means of grace, to encourage us in our faith. We look at the, the sign, and the sign symbolizes the, the body of Jesus Christ given for you and the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you, um, his perfect life given for you, and his death, he died in your place. Uh, the very things we've been talking about today, the wrath of God poured out on Jesus. And so we know that as we, uh, as we, as we look, as we see, as we taste um, these elements, that God will use them as we come in faith, as we receive them in faith to encourage us in our faith as real spiritual food. The, the bread and the fruit of the cup, the uh, the cup, they, they don't change. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing automatic about it. But as we come uh, contemplating, thinking about, and trusting, and not the sign, but what the sign signifies, uh, that God works through it in a powerful way. If you are a member in good standing of any church that, uh, that proclaims what I've been proclaiming today, that Jesus and Jesus alone has merited our eternal life and that we can receive that through faith in him alone, uh, then you're welcome. 
uh, to participate with us today. Uh, if you've not come to that point, uh, then, uh, then do not participate, but instead take Jesus himself. Take the reality uh, through faith today. Uh, let me read from God's word concerning the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, we come today and we set apart these elements, bread and the juice, uh, they're just common elements. But we pray, Father, that, uh, that as you are present, as Jesus is present by his spirit, that he is uh, fellowshipping with us, that he's communing with us by the spirit, and that we, are, uh, that we will be recipients of his uh, grace as we eat and drink, considering the signs uh, that you would encourage us that Jesus has done everything that is necessary for us to be delighted in by you now and for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this, this is my body which is broken for you. Let's take um, uh, a few moments to, to contemplate this, to consider it and to pray, and then afterwards we will uh, receive the bread together. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup. And he said to his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Again, let's take some time to consider this and pray. And afterwards, we will take the cup together.
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which has been shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And because of the reality conveyed in the symbols of the bread and the fruit of the vine, uh, we have hope. And so again, let's sing of that hope by standing and singing uh, the next verses of Living Hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.